welcome back to another Aprium virtual event. Uh, we're very, very happy to have you here today. Um, I'm extra excited uh, because we have a very, very special guest with us as we're talking about behavioral finance today. Um, however, before we get started, just a couple of key notes. Um, all microphones are, are turned off, so nobody can speak in uh, or ask questions. So if you have a question that you want to submit, and we highly encourage submitting questions all along the way, especially today with today's format, um, you will need to use the Q&A tool that's available in the dashboard of your Zoom panel, right? And so if you move your mouse around there on your screen inside of the Zoom, you should see one of the boxes. There will be a chat box, but there should also be one that says Q&A. Please, by all means, feel free, submit your questions along the way, um, and we'll make sure that we address them as we go. Um, we are constantly changing our format here and to see um, kind of what's what everyone enjoys. So today will be a little bit of a different format. We're in a different location. Uh, we're still here at the Aprium office, but in a different place in the office today for a very specific reason. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and present our guest. So uh, today we have presenting with us Harmon Kong, who is the man, the myth, the legend, the co-founder uh, of Aprium Advisors with over three decades of experience in the business, uh, who we have all uh, come to lovingly know and call Yoda around here uh, as we're constantly coming and gleaning his wisdom. Um, so with that, first and foremost, I want to say, Harmon, welcome to the show. Hello, Thank you, Josh. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We're really, really happy yeah. to have you here. So you. I, I have to say, we've done a lot of these events, right? We do it the last Wednesday of every single month. Uh, lots of topics. Mm -hmm. and so what was it about behavioral finance that all of a sudden made you say, hey, you know, raise the hand and... Um, uh, I want to talk about that. You know, that's something I would like to address with with our audience. Why behavioral finance uh, was interesting to me because it's become more and more of a study. And really, what is it? It's it's the study of how um, our psychological psychological biases influence our financial decision making. And uh, it wasn't always the case. And more has been dedicated to the study. When I was in college, there wasn't any class on behavioral finance. And there's reasons why it's kind of risen to the top. And, and I think other reasons why sometimes I, I know you guys probably feel this working here is that sometimes we feel part advisor, part therapist, part <laughs> counselor, uh, and predominantly because, you know, money is a very uh, sensitive topic. It's a very emotional topic, if, and it's still one of the very uh, top common uh, discussions where it, it can create anxiety and a large part of it is because money means uh, financial security to us. Mm -hmm. It also uh, gives us a level of peace of mind. And so as we think about our futures, financial security is extremely important to uh, to who we are and what we're trying to achieve. So when we don't have that and we're striving for that, uh, it can become a very emotional process. And there are, when I think of behavioral finance, there's really two elements to it. There's the cognitive thought which is our left brain. And that's why I, I have this little picture here because uh, the brain, uh, you have the left brain, which is really our rational thinking or, 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 or logic, yeah. uh, how we process information based on what we know. Um, now it's possible that you may not know what you don't know <laughs> and you can make bad decisions sure. on what yeah, you absolutely. know you don't know or what you think you know. And then there's the uh, right side of the brain or right in this picture of the heart, which is really more how our emotions can drive uh, our decision making. So I'm I'm going to spend a little more time on the heart side of things. Uh, and by the way, I'm not a, I'm not a psychologist. So, um, <laughs> but it sometimes feels like we we have to understand a little bit about human behavior. Sure. So we can address this topic uh, well and try to make the best financial decisions uh, well, for ourselves and for our families, right? For our clients. Yeah. Well, you might not be a psychologist. You have definitely. Um, created a company, I think, that is very concerned with and and uh, and concentrates on the heart. Uh, you know, I think that that that's a that's a team that you have here that really it kind of comes from the top down. And um, anybody that knows you knows that you've got a big heart and you really really care about people. You know, not just the ones you know. <laughs> yeah. And so yeah, I think God. that's why um, you know charitable giving is such a, a big thing around here. You know, and Af with Afrim Cares. Yeah. So anyway, so uh, okay, so that's you know, why you've picked behavioral finance, but what, I mean, what the heck is behavioral finance, you know, even yeah. you, to begin with? Well, it's it's really just understanding how, um, 
how you process information, how you think about things, what, how you feel about things, and how that influences your decision making process. So, uh, for good or or, or for bad, uh, it it wasn't always um, like this. And and there's certain things that's happened historically that's made behavioral finance a little more uh, front of mind. Um, and just to give you some background of myself in the 30 years, I think I started doing this, Josh, when you were how old? Um, uh, I would have been <laughs> about nine years old 30 years ago. So I was definitely very interested in Ninja Turtles, I think was probably the go-to <laughs> okay. at, at nine. I don't, I don't remember anything that was happening with the market at that Great. point in time. Okay, well, let me just kind of <laughs> give you a little bit of history for, for, for historical sake and for this discussion. So when I started doing this, it was um, I was a senior in college in 1987, and that was the year the market crashed. The market crash called Black it was a Black Monday, yeah. and the market crashed 20 percent. And I thought to myself, "Wow, I'm going to have to change my major because there's no jobs for me after I graduate in '88." Um, and uh, back then, uh, I did find a job eventually. You know, I ended up working for a corporate uh, company in Wall Street. And back then, uh, we had this idea that the markets are efficient. It's called the efficient market theory. Mm. And it was based on this idea that uh, people have access to the same information at the same time and people, investors, are rational. And because investors are rational, we make rational decisions. And so the market is what the market is. It's, it's, valued, uh, it's valued correctly. And the, 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 the process was to try to un uncover value. Right. And say, well, right. this is worth something because I think it's worth more. It just that everyone else hasn't done the same analysis. And, and I was right. always sh shocked at how you have two different quantitative researchers come up with two different conclusions. But the point I'm trying to make really is that we didn't have information like we have available today. So I distinctly remember how uh, this sort of evolved. And uh, so 1998 and then uh, 1989, and then we went through the nineties of incredible returns. Um, I worked for a company where a, a guy named Peter Lynch was there and Peter Lynch is a Wharton MBA grad. He has probably one, had one of the best track records, ma track records managing the Magellan fund. His average rate of return was 29% on average. Boy, when we like to go back to those years, um, he, um, he understood quantitative analysis. But the one thing uh, he said, which kind of shocked me is, I love this quote, is he said, everyone has brain power to make money in stocks. Not everyone has the stomach. So, so even, even this guy who's a, a Wharton MBA uh, analyst, incredibly successful money manager at the time, we called him the Michael Jordan of, of Wall Street uh, at the time, knew that somehow it's not all cerebral. Um, right. That there are other driving factors. And this is this is at a time see. when efficient market hypothesis was. Yes, that was that was what you learned. That's what and, you learned. You know, and just 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 for the sake of the audience, just to make sure everyone's trending here. Right. The, at, at its core, you know, we can think about different individual companies and we can think about going in, looking at the balance sheet and determining how much do we think a company is worth. Right. Um, but efficient market hypothesis essentially is saying is the price is what the price is. Uh, markets are smart enough. They, they have all the information available, you know, that we could want. Um, and so whatever, whatever the price is on the market, that's the correct price. Yes. Right. So you don't really have to think about anything. You just kind of ride the wave, so to speak. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty profound that even a guy like that would recognize that human behavior, um, uh, is a factor. And so when I think about the gut, you know, it takes a good, strong stomach to do this. Um, I think about discipline, you know, yeah. there's a term we use in investments that, you know, you just need to be a disciplined investor. Sure. And if you had discipline, then you will succeed. Uh, but back then we used to say, you know, if you don't have discipline, don't worry, the market will give it to you uh, because the market will discipline you. <laughs> and I know that person. <laughs> yeah. And, and they give you some perspective on that. Uh, you know, so when the market crashed 20% in 87, you know, we look back and say, well, what was the cause of that? Was it human behavior? We, we I think a large part of it was, you know, the greed, which is an emotion that we sure, yeah. set and drove it to a high level. Uh, and how do we know this? Because people used a lot of margin to buy even more stocks. And so when the market actually crashed uh, that day, we blamed the computers and said, well, if the computer made me do it, uh, rather than taking some sort of personal responsibility saying, well, I sort of caused this. Incidentally, in that year, 
1987, uh, we started out from one point in at one point, the actual market ended up closing up 2% um, that year. So down so, 20% in one day. Yes. But by the end of the year, positive almost 3%. Yes. So, and then, you know, I'll, I'll speak a little bit about 2000 during the tech wreck, because that was sure. that was probably another one. Um, and uh, I think this is where you see some irrational, the term irrational exuberance came into play and in popular. Like, should the S&P be trading at 40 times earnings? Um, it was a time when 1999, when the, when the NASDAQ uh, skyrocketed almost 80%. And I remember that because my my twin boys were born in 2000. It was March when they were born. And I remember looking at the, in the labor and delivery room. I couldn't really concentrate because I looking at the market going, wow, the Nasdaq just hit 5,000. And woohoo, times are good. Um, Y2K was the concern the year before that the clocks wouldn't turn over. And, and then the market hit, hit a new high. Uh, and then the market crashed. The, the you know right after that um, high it continued to grow for about two and a half years so so to put things in perspective um the s p lost 45 percent um in, during that time and the nasdaq lost 80 percent and so, so you, you you know when you experience that kind of loss or those mm -hmm. kind of volatility yeah emotions are pretty high it, it begs the question is is that efficient i mean is it efficient to see the market Go up a bunch, you go down that much. And so I think that was really the beginning of we ought to lay some credibility to behavioral finance and how psychology influences our decision making process. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, you've been doing this for 30 years, you've been through a lot of these different types of market cycles. Um, you know, for everyone that's listening, you know, I mean, a lot of this has to do with behavior, right? And, 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 and habits and having good habits, right? And oftentimes habits are something easy to talk about, easy to say like, oh, you know, I probably shouldn't, you know, spend more than I make, right? Like the, it's easier said than done, yes. right? But over the course of your career, I mean, how have you seen people's behavior change as we go through different market cycles? Uh, I, that's a great question, Josh. I, I honestly, unfortunately, I think the market cycles uh, will have the market cycles yet. I don't, I don't think, um, I don't mean to sound cynical. I don't think, um, investors have really changed much. And it's because uh, the greed factor and the fear factor are very real. And if you look even before the stock market existed, fear and greed have been huge contributors to how we make decisions. Um, so I don't, I, don't, I don't necessarily think that emotion has really changed. We're, we're human. Mm -hmm. And so we respond to our emotions. It's just how we integrate those emotions now into the marketplace is, is really interesting to me. I will note that on the cognitive side, I always find this interesting. And and um, and that is, um, you know, historically, the savings rate in America uh, is about 8% historically. That's the historical average. It's not great. I mean, it needs to be somewhere north of that in order to secure some level of financial security. And that number has been eroding pretty uh, consistently on a negative decline since I started doing this in the 80s and even in the 70s, it was much better than that. Today, the numbers just came out and the savings rate on average in America is 5%, um, which, you know, when you're trying to plan your financial security and your future, I don't know if 5% is going to actually do it. Uh, but what's even more interesting is um, uh, not only are we um, saving a lot, but but we're also uh, not maybe maybe not using debt wisely. We, we hit another record recently, and household debt has exceeded seventeen trillion dollars. Credit card debt is now at almost a trillion. Student loans, one point six trillion today. Now, granted, the mortgage and real estate boom has been a big contributor to rising household debt. Right, because uh, low, low interest rates. Everyone's got to get a mortgage. Yeah, right? Everyone's yeah. got to get a mortgage. Right now, if you got a mortgage a year ago, you know, a little over a year ago, you got a nice under three percent rate. Yeah. So the debt burden to income isn't as burdensome. It's manageable. But it also, I, I think from a financial planning standpoint, it's it's a little bit, it makes you pause and go, okay, so if we're not saving enough and we're save, taking up six of debt, are we investing? If we're not saving, then we're not investing. So where does that, where do we, I guess, end up you right. know, 15 years from now, 20 years from now? So cognitively, I think most people know Logically, the left brain says, hey, you know, Josh, it's probably not a good idea to um, spend everything you, you earn and use debt. It's probably a good idea to more like save a little for your future, save for the rainy days, right. my mom right. used to say, and uh, try not to take out excessive debt or debt that's, you know, just doesn't make any sense. And 
So I, I wonder why is the disconnect? Like we know inherently that we should probably do it, but, but we don't do it. And, and so right. it's, it's not right. for the lack of financial illiteracy. Sure. It, it's oftentimes, you know, I actually just have to do the right thing. And so, so sometimes I equate it to a, a medical appointment and you guys all go to get medical checkups, right? You, I've you got, go, right? I got an appointment coming on the 22nd of June. Okay. And, and, <laughs> What do your doctor you tell you if you don't have good blood test results? Well, I might he might say something like, "Josh, stop going in and out so much. You know, it's not you're doing a, anything good for your, guy. for your uh, for your cholesterol levels aren't aren't looking great. You no know, more animal fries for you. Yeah, exactly. No, no double exactly. doubles. I, I think it's time to you know maybe eat some yeah. more vegetables. And, yeah. And, and uh, what about exercise? Have anything to do with it? it increase the exercise. Okay. You should exercise more, right? right? Like you need to exercise more. You need to eat healthier. Yeah. So let me ask you a question, Josh. I know that you're supposed to be interviewing me, but um, you know this to be true, right? Yeah, yeah. Do you need a doctor to tell you you probably should not um, eat bad? You should probably eat a little more healthy. And Josh, probably a good idea to get out there and exercise a little more if you want to improve the numbers of your health on your health exam. So to know that that's what I need I'm not to trying do. to make this about no, you, I, but I don't need the doctor. But I can say that that typically it's like, it's like going to get your teeth cleaned, right? Like you go, you get your teeth cleaned. And then after you're like really good about like, rushing as many times per day and flossing as often yeah. as you should right you go see your doctor and you and you're like okay you start exercising you start eating healthy but then it di it dies off right yeah. time goes by and you you're not quite as consistent and and staying on it the way that you probably well at least for me you know i, I don't know about all you guys out there but for me you know typically I, some time goes on and i start to i start to trail off and and that's why it's good to go and see him on an annual basis right that's right and now you know I, i'm the same way i totally i think a lot of us can relate to that the cycle of physical health um you know and so I, I bring that up only just i want to make a point and the point is that um you actually don't need to have a phd in finance or mba or a bscfp to understand that there's certain foundational knowledge that is going to be good for you financially right and that is you, you know what we just talked about you can try to try to uh, save save for the future Right. Avoid the use of debt and uh, don't spend everything you earn, really. I, I, I mean, that's, I think, a crisis that we face in, in this country mm -hmm. for households is spending more uh, than we earn. So we know that, but then the left, the right side of the brain says, no, but I want it now, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, learned, I learned a term a few, few years ago called FOMO, the fear of missing out. <laughs> uh, so is it, are we sacrificing short-term gratification for longer term security. And right. I love some right. of the quotes that I read from other financial gurus like Dave Ramsey, who says, live like no one today, so you can live, live like, like no, no one tomorrow. One. Yeah. And, you know, when we see numbers like that, it, it, it is counterculture to uh, do what everyone's not doing. Right. Um, sure. But do we have to discipline, there's that word again, discipline to do that, um, knowing that we have some blind spots and our blind spots are our emotional response and how we actually make decisions daily. And so that's why this topic is to me, really important. I, I think it's really, really important that everyone understand how your how you're wired and how your wiring or your subconscious bias can influence decisions. Um, so, so you say the word bias, and I yeah. think you know, and I, I you know. Sorry for preaching everybody, but, you know, I, I think this is a good point to talk a little bit about. All right, if we were to get a little bit more technical about yeah. the topic of behavioral finance, I mean, what are what are these biases that we naturally have when it yeah. comes to uh, our money? OK, that's a that's a really good question. So there's a lot. Um, and again, I, I'm not a psychologist, so I'm going to but I am going to highlight four um, that I think are relevant to this topic and this discussion as it relates to financial decision making. Sure. Um, I know, you know, in full disclosure, I've made every single one of these mistakes. So just throwing that out there. I'm, you know, the thing about investing is you're not always going to be right. Uh, the the yeah. key is to be right most of the time and to really understand your, your blind spots. So the first uh, subconscious bias that I think impacts investment decisions is this bias called loss aversion. And loss aversion is, is really this idea that um, it's more painful to lose money um, I feel more pain when I lose money uh, than the pleasure of making money. So when the loss is greater than the, the pain, um, it, it's uh, my loss of virgin bias. So how does that actually work? Well, uh, when the market goes down or I buy a stock and it goes down 10%, I immediately just want to sell it, right? I just sell it. And then, yeah. you know, I'll wait for things to settle down 
And when things get better, I'll buy it back. And so um, I'm buying high, I'm selling low. That's loss aversion. And, and so actually some of the mistakes I've made personally is just selling too early. Um, the market has a level of volatility that's normal. So uh, a 20, a 15%, a 10% drop is, is sort of normal. Uh, it's not fun, uh, sure, but it, it is kind of normal. Now, when you start getting 20% drops, that there, there might be something else going on. That's where we start to dig into that. But I, I share this uh, next chart for you because I think it, I think it, it sort of speaks to that. And uh, this is the chart of emotion, how fear and greed can play into your decision making process. So what happens is in loss aversion, we buy at a certain level, and here it shows high. Right. Oh no. Well, we make it first in investment, and we buy it. Then the price goes down and, and then we sell it. Um, and then the joke here, this is from Behavior Gap from a guy named Carl Richards, who, who's done these kind of comical charts. And it basically says repeat until broke. So you want a sure way to be unsuccessful, then uh, do this repeat over and over and over. And, and quite frankly, we we see that a lot, not just with our clients, but sometimes some of the new clients that we have that may be thrown in the talent said, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not cut out for this. Um so buying low and selling high is easier said than done. Yeah, I think Warren Buffett's the one that said investing is simple, right? Yeah. <laughs> Buy low, sell high. The yeah. concept is simple, but it's not easy. It's not easy. So I'm going to take that on the other, flip that around, say buying low and selling high is easier said than done. If cool. that's true, then buying high and selling low, buying high and selling low is easier done than said. <laughs> I mean, right, it's easy. Yeah. It, it feels good to cut my losses, right? Yeah. It's going to cut my losses. And, it, and, it, and so it's very easy to do. But, and then the market goes back or stock goes back. Yeah, I'm not going to talk about that anymore. So that's where the, the part I say flip it and say selling low is easier done than said because no one yeah. no one talks about the losers. Yeah. You know, or, I, so, I think ben, ben has said multiple times before that it's always easy to sell. Yeah. Right. The set, sell is easy. Right. But, you know, the question is when when do you when do you get back in? Yeah. What's your method for getting back? Once you sell and you hit that button and you say, I, I can't yeah. take the ride, I'm out. Yeah. What's the plan for getting back in? Or where are we going next? Right. You know, what are we doing there? Yeah. You know, and do you have a do you have something developed to, to help you yeah. move forward from there? So so another guru I like to quote his is Warren Buffett, and, and he speaks to this as well. And, and Warren Buffett is another uh, probably the most the most successful uh, investor of our time in our generation, and we still add him and Charles Charlie Munger. But he um, his quote I love is "Be greedy when people are fearful, and fearful when people are greedy." And so he speaks directly to fear and greed as having a factor. So you know Warren we know is a great quantitative an analyst and researcher. Mm -hmm. He looks for value in companies and he owns them. Is he always right? Um, depends. I think in the long run, he's right. But, you know, in, in the year uh, 2008 in crisis, his stock was down 45%. Uh, mm -hmm. And there are some stocks that he owned um, that were down 80%. Mm -hmm. uh, did he panic and, and sell? Uh, no, I think he he capitalized on certain opportunities to find that, hey, there might be some good deals out there. Um and so, but that's hard to do, right? I was going to say, it's intuitively speaking, stuff. again, that's that's your whole, you know, the brain and the heart, yeah. right? Like you have yeah. the two, and the brain says, "Hey, everything's on sale," yeah, right. Which I love to say, Landon jokes, you know, when he talks about how I love Black Friday shopping, which I do, but um, but everything's on sale. But when it comes to investments, we don't we don't run to make the yeah. buys, right? We, and, we typically don't because that fear sort of takes over, and and you know, I can count back in history anytime there's something really bad in the news, how our inclination is to sell. And uh, this is where the counseling part comes to play because we've had to talk a lot of people off the cliff in the history, uh, at least in my career. And I, I can go back to, you know, um, the day before we, in, when 9-11 was a good example. Um, when that happened, the inclination was to sell because the market was going to get ugly. And I, I remember multiple calls um, uh, taken from clients. And even uh, when we decided to invade Iraq, uh, mm -hmm. There was worry of a lot of loss of life, weapons of mass destruction. Uh, and so as a student of the market, I, I've always known that if you kind of look back in the market, the, the, it's been a good wealth creator. Sure. Stocks and even real estate to extent, both have been really great wealth creators to secure uh, people's uh, financial future. 
However, it, it, it requires a certain level of, of discipline. Um, so back in those events as a student, I, I remember studying like, okay, what happened? What, what did the market do when John F. Kennedy was assassinated? What did it do when Pearl Harbor was bombed? And if you look at history, you'll find that, wow, in almost every incident, that was a great time to buy. Uh, so that sort of articulates the fear factor of being a great time to buy. Uh, we in the industry know this. And we watch it, so we kind of we kind of watch what other people are doing, and sort of the consensus. If everyone's running sure. the other way, we go into it, uh, even though it's very uncomfortable. So even in the incidents I've experienced, um, after there's a major event like that, very rare. I, I I can think sometimes, and I'm working with sometimes hundreds of people. Not rarely do I get a call and say, "Hey, Harmon, let's buy." <laughs> It, it doesn't happen. It's, yeah. whoa, wh what do we do now? Yeah. Um, uh, and sometimes the best trade is no trade. So something to think, something to think about. So that's loss aversion bias. Sure. Um, that's why I wanted to speak about a few because there's so many to talk about. But I think another bias that I've seen is overconfidence bias. Okay. It's, when, it's when an investor overestimates um, sometimes their own knowledge or their own understanding of risk. So they take on more risk than they actually understand. You see this sure. sometimes when um, maybe people own a concentrated position. Yeah. Um, too much of one. Too thing. much of one thing. Right. Diversification is a way to reduce that. Um, sometimes you're your worst advisor. Um, you don't know what you don't know. Um, when the tech uh, bubble happened, I, I remember I was at a conference on the East Coast and I was heading to a conference and I got in a taxi and the guy says, hey, where are you from? And I told him, and he goes, oh, where are you going? I go, I'm going to attend this conference for the investment conference. And he immediately started telling me, yeah, oh yeah, I invest. And uh, he was talking about how he was trading stocks and and uh, making all this money, you know, rising tide in the market kind of makes us all feel like we're really smart and intelligent and maybe we should change careers and become a, a investment advisor or investment manager from being a taxi driver. <laughs> uh, but I even had a neighbor who took on an equity loan uh, one, one year and bought more stock from the company he worked at because he said, well, I know uh, because I work there and I know what's going on and, and I know it's good. Right. Uh, and that was just before the market crash. That stock, by the way, dropped 90% in, in the crash. And so uh, and he took a he took a really big hit. Uh, he eventually moved out of the neighborhood. I don't know what happened to him, but it, it's, it's you know, hard, hard for me to see that and hear that. Right. Uh, but that's where overconfidence bias can really, really... Um, Kind of mess you up financially so right. it, it's it's good to kind of kind of make sure hey do i really understand what the risks are um, I, I could say i mean it, even even in our shoes sometimes that all that overconfidence that oftentimes the the general population has over something can even begin and i know for myself personally it can begin to persuade me you know sure. and I, I could definitely say as an example and you know, when we're getting towards the end of 2021, which was not that long ago, right? And tech was the place to be. And it had just been soaring for a long time. And I had a lot of conversations about why why don't you hold more tech, right? Yeah. And I started thinking, well, maybe we should be holding more tech, even though that my, the, my brain side says, no, we need to have good diversification across sectors, right? We need to be careful, yep. not over-concentrate in any one area. But then I find myself going to the investment team saying, well, you know, should we maybe have a little bit more of the, I mean, it's been going great for everyone. Yeah. And then what happened in 2022, right? All of a sudden, uh, tech was out of favor. Uh, yeah. You know, the NASDAQ was down, what, 33% over the course of the year. Um, uh, whereas, you know, if you looked at just the broad market as a whole, it was down about negative 18, negative 19 yeah. or so. Yep. Right. And, um, so, I mean, that, that even hasn't, an, has an effect, uh, because you're talking to so many people that are feeling overconfident. Am I at least thinking of that in the right light? No, you're, you're, I, you're absolutely right. Uh, Josh, sometimes a rising market makes us all feel a little good and confident that, well, I must be, I must know what I'm doing, but I do I really know what I'm doing? Um, uh, some do and some some don't, but you have to uh, attribute some of it to, you know, hey, did you just get lucky? Uh, I know, I, but I think it's important to just understand, it, am I overly confident? What do I know that I don't know? Sure. Um, and so there are ways to mitigate an overconfidence bias, but a rising tide in the market it makes us all feel pretty good about investing. And where this can lead to problems is that you buy a stock or you buy an investment, or you invest in the market and the market goes up a lot. So you say, wow, that was a good decision I made. You know what? I think I'm going to buy more. 
and then you buy more at a price that yeah that doesn't make sense maybe it's too expensive sure you know your your left brain your logical state brings in yeah it's really gone up a lot maybe i should be selling instead of buying um so you buy more thinking you know this is the right thing to do and, and then you, you get you disciplined uh, yeah. later on so uh, you know overconfidence bias is is a, is a is another significant one that i wanted to share with our audience because i think that can impact um, your decision making and how you invest and even, even how you make financial plans sure um how does this affect the financial plan what well, well there, there's a lot of people who think that you know if i put five percent the average savings rate today and and don't really invest uh for the future that somehow i'm going to be able to retire right is that a overconfidence bias like you're really confident that that's going to get you where you need to be um and so sometimes overconfidence could just be the plan it is overly optimistic and, and you're overconfident that what you're doing might be um you know what if you're wrong you know sure. what if what you're doing is wrong and, and you've done 30 you've been doing this for 30 years um i'll speak a little person but you know my dad um he wasn't a big investor he was an educator a college professor and he didn't really invest until i started doing this and uh it actually was three years actually working at my corporate job that he find because I used to pest him all the time. And he said, okay, well, here's the deal. You can invest my money, but you know, if you make a mistake and fail, I'm moving in with you. And I go, well, you're not moving in with me because I don't want you living with me. So that was my motivation to make sure he succeeded. But as I looked at this financial plan, he didn't do any investing. Most of his money was in banks, you know, bank CDs and, mm -hmm. and, you know, historically, uh, Money market CDs have not kept pace with inflation, uh, especially when you attribute taxation on interest. Um, so was he overconfident that he would get to where he needed to be? Or, or was it a lack of just cognitive reasoning that he just didn't know what he didn't know? But uh, I, I think eventually um, you know, overconfidence can kind of lead to miscalculations. Sure, uh, sure. And, well, and your bias there. Would you say, I mean, Hearing he's not, something like he is retired, by the way. Just to hedge that out there. He <laughs> so you did a good job. You did a good job. And he's not living with me, and he <laughs> does not manage his money anymore. Uh, thank goodness. Um, would, would you say, I mean, would that did that comment at all make you invest more conservatively than you probably should have for him? Well, um, I, th I think that's where planning is really important. Yeah, I don't think anyone should take unnecessary risk than, than the goal she's into, and sure, and um, you know. You know, we tend to compare ourselves to others, um, but really, you know, everyone has a goal to achieve, and our some of our challenges is trying to understand how to get you to your financial goal, your financial security uh, mm -hmm. that you need, uh, in a way that allows you to sleep at night. Um, and I, I think in the tech wreck that you know when that happened in 1999, I, I saw a lot of investors throw away risk management and investors, in fact, in fact, you know, investors that. Uh, good people, well intended, but they sold all their conservative investments, and bonds, and uh, did not diversify. Mm -hmm. So I remember meeting with uh, investors, and they say, "I'm pretty diversified, Harmon, because look, I got uh, a communication stock, a fiber optic company, I got a computer maker, a chip maker, an internet company, and uh, <laughs> AOL and Yahoo, and I think I'm pretty well diversified." I go, you, you know, that's all in one sector. Yeah, and, and I remember. Uh, you know, there was a fund back then called Janus Global Technology, did 200% in 1999. And um, uh, they did a lot of IPOs because they were to give up, get into these IPOs sure. really cheap. They were large. Uh, so they gave a perception that, yeah. you know, you could do this too. So I actually met, knew somebody who, uh, who that year, we were pretty aggressive for his particular portfolio, but he, he made like 70% in 1999. And then he said that wasn't good enough. So he was going to give, put it all in Janus Global Tech. And I said, that, yeah, I don't think that's smart. Uh, and he did. And uh, that fund lost 90%. Year, so, you know, yeah. you, you got wiped out. <laughs> we actually remained friends for a long time. And <laughs> go go back to that as a reference of, wow, uh, we'll do that again. Um, so, okay. So here's a question for you. I mean, you've been doing this a long time. We've talked about a lot of different downturns, right? And then upturns in the market. And that can happen at different paces, right? You talk about Black Monday and the market dropping 20%. In, and that was in a day, right? 20% in one day, right? But then you think of something like, like an 08, 
right? And the markets slowly but surely came down, you know, all the way going into 2009 before it ever actually bottomed out. And I yes. think it dropped, what, about 57% over the course of that? And so this was- Yeah, this a good 50%. So it was actually worse than the tech wreck. And, and probably what made it worse is it, it was a grinding decline. Yeah. Um, so it was very uncomfortable for a lot of people. So the idea of efficient market uh, uh, theory yeah. um, kind of gets thrown out the window when you're down 50%. Uh, and emotions are running high and right. questioning whether or not the system is even going to last. So it, you, you do have to have a strong discipline and fortitude that, uh, you know, things uh, will work its way out. But here's here's the, the, the thing is that it's really important to note is that that's why good planning is important. Um, and that's why we emphasize planning. You should always have an emergency fund or liquidity that's not invested in the market because you might need it. And the worst thing that can happen, at least on our watch as your advisor, is that the market just went down and you say, oh, I need money for this. And now we have to sell something when the market's down. And I would say that's a tribute for not very good planning, that you haven't set aside funds for uh, a what if scenario. Um, right. What if things get bad? So it's always prudent. I, I, you know, people say, how much money do you keep in the bank? I say, well, typically what I'm going to spend and then for emergencies, but aside from that, I, I know long term. My money can do for, more for me by investing in it, but it doesn't mean I'm just because the rate of return on the stock market is higher than cash over a long period of time that I take all my money and stick it in the market, right? Because timeline is really important: short term, intermediate term, and long term goals. Right. But for my long term money, I I want to be invested. So anyway, I, I know we're we're kind of going a lot in the overconfidence, but I think it's a it's a huge one. Um, Another one I'd like to share is just this thing called anchoring bias. Um, okay, what is that? And anchoring bias is when we we make a decision and then we we based on certain information, sure. And then we we don't new information comes, but we we don't adjust to that. So a lot of it this happens. I think it's it happens in more real estate, but it also happens in investing as well. Which an example would be. Um, you know, I'm thinking about selling my home and my neighbor just sold his home for a million five. We live in Southern California. So, so I got to sell my home for a million Yeah, five. so I got to sell my home for a million five. Yeah, interest rates just rose right. dramatically. So someone says, I'll give you a million four. And we say, no, because I want the million five or higher. But the variables have changed. Um, so anchoring is when we're, we're so fixated on that price that we dig our heels in and say, I'm not, Selling for that, I'm just going to hold on to that. And the reverse happens even on the buy side. We buy something and it goes up, maybe it doubles. And we say, oh gosh, I'm not going to buy more of that. This price is too high. But maybe it's increased for a good reason. And maybe there's new information that validate that makes sense. This is actually a good investment. So it's okay to buy at a higher price if something or a catalyst has changed that may can warrant that investment still a good investment. So anchoring can can be disruptive in how we make decisions. Um, you, you know, I commonly see this when when people uh, sell when they sell when the market's down. Um, it's it's hard. So they sell it at say fifty dollars a share, and then it doesn't go down. It actually goes up. And then it goes up to sixty dollars a share, and they're even even though the the future is brighter, it's hard for them to buy it at sixty five because they sold it at fifty. So they miss out on a good investment because they emotionally sold it low and it's harder to buy back when it goes higher. So we anchor on this idea that, yeah, but I sold it at 50. I, I'm not going to buy it at 60. And so sometimes people do that with the market. You know, I sold out in the last political election because I didn't like what was happening. So I sold everything and went to cash and then the market's 25% higher. Mm -hmm. Now I'm not going to buy now because it's even higher. And, and so we're not always taking into consideration, hey, things have changed. Right. So that's anchoring bias. Um, what what um, about, I mean, if I'm going to be, if I'm, if I consider myself a long-term investor, Harmon, and I buy something, right. And, um, and the price goes down, I mean, aren't, aren't I just supposed to hold on to it because I'm a long-term investor? Um, I mean, is that, is, is that causing my anchoring bias, you know, because I think that that's, that's supposed to be considered like good yeah. investing habits, right? I'm a long-term investor, yeah. I'm going to hold on. I, I'd say that's a right. general, uh, again, that's, that's called generalization bias, uh -huh. like simplifying things, <laughs> of which I'm not going to talk about, but, but uh, you know, the reality is that you, you have to do your homework, right? Yeah. And to see, okay, just because I paid this for it and the price is at, uh, um, 
is this still a good investment? So the way we like to look at investments and everything we own is it's like cash. Mm. If it's converted to cash, it's cash. So if I had money today, would I buy that investment? And my answer is yes, then I hold it. So I ask this question a lot because I, I've seen clients um, come in and they have a highly concentrated position in a stock that they've owned for many years. Maybe it's a company they work at. And this is hypothetically say it's a million dollars. And the rest of the portfolio is a lot less than that. So clearly not diversified. 25, 30% of the wealth or even 50% of the wealth is tied up in one stock. So the rhetorical question I might ask is, if you had a million dollars today, would you buy that one company? Uh, put it all in there. And I don't get convictions of, yes, I would. Because that's a lot of money to, to put in one company, right? Sure. That's where the, the rational mind says, that's a lot of money to put your future on. Uh, no pain, no gain, right? But uh, would you do that? And that's a good question to ask to see whether or not am I um, looking at this right way and just being emotional about it? Am I overconfident because I, you know, I know this company? Um, or does diversification actually make sense? Should I take some out, maybe to pay a tax if I have to, and diversify it? Uh, I, I, again, um, the stock could still go up if you sell some of it, um, but um, it could also go down. Uh, the the other um, thought, uh, you know, behavior bias I want to talk about. I think everyone knows this one: herd behavior. The oh, herd, the herd know, mentality. The herd, the sheep. Yeah, you no, know, it's hey, everyone else is doing it, so should I? And so this is um, this is uh, where we we don't do any real analysis or understanding, other than you know, uh, a friend of mine told me to buy this or. And I trust him. You know, He's a smart guy. Um, He's a smart guy. He does his research. Yeah. So and so bought this yeah. and he made a lot of money. So therefore, I'm going to buy it. Right. Um, I was watching the news and the news said the market's bullish. So I'm going to buy it. Or I was watching the news and they said, you know, sell. So I'm going to sell because everyone else is selling. Let me, let me just <laughs> make a point here. If it's in the news, it's too late. You know, if it's in the media, it, the information is too late. Right. Uh, the market's already adjusted. And, uh, so you got to be careful what, where you get information from and you know, how you're deciphering that information and making sure that your decisions aren't herd basis, herd behavior. Right. Uh, so you do it. You have to, I think it's warrants taking the pause and feel like you're, you're, that herd bias is coming in. And granted, you know, not everyone has these biases. Um, some have more than others. Um, but it's just more about awareness. What are your biases? I'm only bringing up four. But I think I bring up herd because it's a common one. It uh, goes back to what I said, that, you know, that acronym your generation uses, FOMO, the fear of missing out. Oh, yeah. oh my gosh, my ship has sailed away and yeah. I'm missing out. Bye, bye, bye. I think there's a commentator on TV that says, bye, bye, bye. <laughs> help, help, help. <laughs> uh, so that's kind of like herd mentality. Yeah, bye, bye, bye. Okay, that's fine because everyone else is buying. Um, so that's herd, man herd mentality. So... Okay, well, uh, those are a few. Are there any other biases that you, you think are important to highlight, or do you want to talk a little bit about? I mean, in these cases, what do we what do we do about? Yeah, that? what's the solution? Um, before I do that, um, I want to share with you um, uh, a study that was done in uh, two thousand one, and it was by Dalbar. They did a study entitled "Quantitative Analysis of Investor Behavior." Uh, because because of uh, behavior finance has become sort of a science now. I mean, people are getting doctorate degrees in this now because they're really trying to understand, can you quantify people's emotions and cognitive error thinking that leads to bad investor behavior? Uh -huh. What they found in a 17-year study back then, I think this is really like the proliferation of it, is that they found that the average investor uh, from 1983 to the year 2000 uh, achieved an average rate of return of 5.32. Okay. This at least is positive over 17 years. Sure. However, if you just put it in the index, the S&P 500, and those are some boom years in the 80s and 90s, your average rate of return would have been 16.29. So it's a big difference. Dalbert concluded that human behavior and investor behavior had a negative influence on your investment returns over a long period of time. And I think that's, that gave a lot of credibility to, hey, maybe we ought to look at this as something we should consider. So uh, I give you four biases and um, and how they can lead to poor uh, decision-making um, 
that can impact your financial security. Um, I, I guess, like you said, what? So what do we do about that? I yeah, mean, is there solutions? I I would say that there that there there are solutions. Uh, really quick, uh, you you gave me a pretty fun graphic. Let's see if I can find it here really quick. So this is again from um, from Carl Richardson and. Uh, uh, this is probably one solution. Uh, so knowing that you have biases, but I'm going to speak to uh, some other solutions as well that can help you make better decisions. Uh, so this this um, it sort of articulates our role uh, as a advisor. What is our role? There's you, and then there's us, and we're kind of like the gatekeeper of you making a bad decision. And that's why I said, why is this topic important to me? Because sometimes we feel like therapists or counselors, like. You know, no, don't do that. Um, you know, that's not a good decision. Uh, and we're really trying to understand where are you getting this motivation to make this decision? Is it purely emotional? Do you have a, a quantitative reason why this makes sense? But, you know, so I think what's interesting about this is that it is really where uh, we come into play and can help you make a difference. Um, incidentally, there are other solutions, but uh, Vanguard, uh, you know, Vanguard Mutual Funds did a study and they found that um, the role of the advisor can actually add uh, uh, three percentage points on your longer term return. And what I found interesting about this study, because I read the study, is that 50% uh, of that 3% comes from behavioral coaching, as you can see on that um, on that graph there. So again, I'm kind of arguing this Carl Richardson's graph of, you know, the role of an advisor and really a lot of what we're doing is coaching uh, on the quantitative side, what we're doing on our investment team is portfolio construction. Right. And how having the right balance uh, to the portfolio, the right asset allocation to the portfolio uh, can make a difference in how you navigate your return and how you, how it prevents you from making bad decisions by having the right risk profile to the portfolio. So it matches your, your timeline, your goal, your level of comfort. And that's why portfolio having the not just any portfolio construction is portfolio construction that matches me as the, as an investor and in what I'm trying to do. And then the other piece that they attributed to that delta of three percent was wealth management, which you know if you've been a client of ours, you know that we 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 think investing is important, uh, but it is a subtotal. Right. There's a grand total, which is you know what about taxes? What about you know estate planning and other factors that can. Uh, contribute to the bottom line uh, or what we call the grand total and not just the subtotal of the portfolio. So I found it interesting that Vanguard, who's been a champion for do it yourself, is actually validating the fact that, you know, some of our clients who've done it themselves haven't really had a lot of success. Right. So right. Um, now if you are really um, proficient and sure. you don't yeah. need an advisor, yeah. Hey, that's fantastic. Um, you can make decisions rationally and it's so irrational, then I think that's great. Uh, but if you're not, um, some things that I would say would help you mitigate this, it would be just being self-aware. Yeah. I think the beginning of everything in terms of whole health, uh, wholeness of yourself, just knowing your blind spots. Right. Right. Um, and sometimes, sometimes you don't know what it is until you actually experience a little bit of uh, challenge or, or you know, pain, uh, but know yourself. And that'll help you make better decisions. And then having a long-term plan, understand where, where am I trying to go? Uh, what is the goal here? Uh, it's because oftentimes people make short-term decisions on a long-term plan and, and then it derails the whole thing. And, and sometimes that comes from maybe selling at all the wrong times or uh, overemphasizing lack of diversification. Uh, making short-term decisions, long-term plan never accomplishes a long-term plan. So sure. yeah. it's important to have that. And then, Diversification is another way to mitigate some of the risks. So not, don't put in all your eggs in one basket. Lastly, I will say another one is a healthy appetite for daily market news. That's actually not one that they talk about, but it's one that I'm going to talk about, at least in the <laughs> world of behavioral finance. And the reason why I say that is because in my experience, I'm going to share some quotes with you guys. So uh, this is kind of kind of fun. They'll walk down memory lane. Why have a healthy appetite for daily market news? You, you know, it's, 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 interesting to watch the news and learn about the economy and the markets. I mean, there's always something to worry about today. There's the debt ceiling and different things, but let me, um, let me read some quotes and I think you'll find this, if anything, entertaining, if not interesting. Um, December 2000, the three to five year earnings projections 
of more than a thousand analysts, though exhibiting some signs of flattening in recent months, have generally held firm. Such expectations, should they persist, bode well for continued capital deepening and sustained growth. Who said that? Alan Greenspan, really? the Fed chairman, just before the market crashed, the tech rate. Right? Uh, Larry Wachtel, he was a commentator on the news, 1999, um, Prudential macroeconomist, says, most of these stocks are reasonably priced. There's no reason for them to correct violently in the year 2000. And, ooh, ooh, ouch. Um, how about this one? Um, Sun Micro probably has the best near-term outlook of any company I know. It was at 60 bucks a share. Dropped to 30 bucks a share, down to 10 bucks a share, down to three dollars in two years. You know who said that? Who said that? Jim Cramer. Bye bye bye. Sell, sell, sell. You know, I find that interesting. And there's several others, and, and a lot of these people are well known in the media world. Sure. Uh, but a healthy digestion of that. And one more I'll share with you, because this is kind of the last one. Uh, you'll never guess who said this. I expect that there um, be some failures of smaller banks. Among the largest banks and capital ratios remain good, and I don't anticipate any serious problems of that sort among the large internationally active banks that make up a very substantial part of our banking system. When was this? This was uh, February 2008. Oh, who said that? You'll never guess. Maybe you will. Ben Bernanke, Federal Reserve Chairman. So the list goes on. And so what I'm trying to say is that um, you know, even <laughs> even the so-called experts get it wrong, and, yeah. and, and um, you know, so that's why I say healthy, healthy appetite. Only eat what you can, you can handle. Don't take a big chomp of some of the news. And like I yeah. said, if it's in the news, it's probably a little late. Um, so anyway, those, those are some of my thoughts, Josh. Yeah. Okay. So I got I have I have a few thoughts that just kind of came up while while you were covering all of that. And guys, uh, so. Just quick note, we got about five minutes left in the hour. If you have any questions, I would go ahead and submit them now. If not, we're going to end at, at 2 p.m. and respect everyone's time. But on that note, I kind of want to go, I want to jump back here. Um, so two things. It's funny because the two thoughts that I have actually have to do with two separate friends. Okay, so I have one friend who um, we we now manage his money. Uh, and he, but he's a CFP. Right, really, really smart guy, very capable, and he's 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 he can manage his own money and, and do a good job of it. He calls himself a recovering day trader. Now he, jo yeah. he jokes about being a recovering day trader, but he could really do it himself. One of the conversations that we had though came down to um, how much time he was spending doing it. And while yes, he could do it proficiently, he knows what he's doing. That's not his career, and that's not where he makes his money. And it didn't make sense for him to. To continue to do this, even if we, even if he could get the exact same returns as us, or even slightly better, it didn't make sense for him to be doing it full time, right? Yeah. For somebody that really knows the business and understands investing and understands financial planning and could really do it himself, right? And so, uh, even being proficient, right? And it, there's no reason not to do it yourself if you can do it yourself, yeah. right? Cool. However. How much time are you spending doing it? Yeah. And is that an appropriate amount of time or is it too much? Yeah. Or or is it too little right. if you're going to manage it yourself? Are you spending too little time yeah. doing it? So where is that healthy balance if you're going to manage right. it yourself? That's a great point, Josh. Um, you know, I have experienced that too in my career. I mm -hmm. used to trade a lot when I was in my early 20s. And um, sort of like driving down the 405, I changed lanes a lot, thinking I'd get there faster. And I realized, you know, this is very exhausting. Um, and then some of the investments I made that I didn't trade at all did just as well. Um, so it was a humbling moment of, of overconfidence bias that I thought I could beat the market. Uh, and you can at times, it's okay, but you're not always going to beat the market every, every time. Every time. Uh, but it is, it's about lifestyle choice. So I don't, uh, I'll be full disclosure. I, uh, I don't, uh, I don't do my own taxes, even though I probably could. I'd rather not. Um, there are a lot of things that we have to choose in life that, uh, you have to look at your schedule or your lifestyle. And, you know, so some people like to look at the markets and actively invest, and that's a hobby or fun. Uh, but they're playing on the real, it's the real thing. Yeah. Uh, others would rather do something else. I think the commonality with our clients is that they have other lives to live. Yeah. And as Rhonda says, um, you know, she's known. So I, I, we do what 
we do for our clients so they can get back to life. Right. And uh, I think that's so, so true to, to your friend's point. Is that, yeah. You know, it is time concerns. You know, I don't, this case, several sets of eyes and ears to do what we do. Yeah. Um, we surround ourselves with people that, you know, we can uh, feel good about the confidence level and what yeah. we're doing. So, well, and I'll tell you, and so that, and that actually leads me right into my other friend that you made me think of. So the time that I was in the best shape of my life was when I was consistently going to the gym with my friend who is a personal trainer. Now, I learned how I'm supposed to exercise. I understand the workouts. I understand what I'm supposed to do, right? I, I'm at the point now where I know the amount of reps, but I am nowhere near in as good a shape as I was when I was consistently going with him, who's a personal trainer. Now, it wasn't just when we were there. It was also the follow-up calls that I got afterwards. Yeah, I'd wake up in the morning, right? And I'd have a text message, right? You know, uh, a little late morning and be like, what are you eating? Right. That would get, that would be a message that I would end up getting from him. Right. Um, or I was at the time I was actually trying to gain weight. I was really, really small yeah. and I was trying to put extra muscle on. Um, and so he was constantly checking on me to make sure that I was just constantly snacking all of the time. Yeah. Um, and it was those little things that I could do it myself. I could absolutely do it myself. Yeah. Uh, and even today, I still remember all the things that I learned when I was exercising with him consistently, but I'm not nearly as I'm not in as good a shape. Yeah. I'm not as proficient as I was when I was working with him through it. And he was right. coaching me through that yeah. and being that barrier, right? Being that wall that you talk about, there was me and then there's in and out on the other side of the wall. <laughs> and then there was my buddy, Greg, right. that was right there in the middle right. saying like, Hey, yeah. you know, maybe we could just have a protein shake. We'll yeah. save some money. Right. Yeah. And we'll, we'll have something that, that fills us up. That's good for our body at the yeah. same time. You know, yeah, but sure. now he's not there. That barrier is not yeah. there. And yeah. I'm driving home and I veer off yeah. and I go, you know, do something that, yeah. that I know yeah. I shouldn't be. Doing. I think there are a lot of lessons here in terms of knowledge versus behavior. And, yeah. They, yeah. you know, I've heard this before is that you, you actually only uh, believe what you do. Sure. Um, and we can have the knowledge, but if we don't do it, we know then, you know, what what's the point? And I think that's the difference maybe between knowledge and wisdom. You know, sure. There's actions, uh, sort of word, word action, phrase actions, speak loud in words. Um, resonance. Um, this has been a huge topic. It, there's a lot more that can be said, and, and we probably missed a few things. I'm sure. Um, uh, could you could do you think you could just give us uh, a, a brief summary before we close here on <laughs> maybe those those key uh, the key takeaway items of today's conversation? Yeah, I I, I think uh, uh, to me, um, you know. Uh, Self-awareness is extremely important, and um, it's good to have some accountability in terms of uh, your finances as well as life in general. So um, I, I talked about self-awareness being uh, a solution to it, and just know yourself. Uh, I think that's going to make you a better whole person, um, not just in your financial decision, but life in general. Um, and uh, surround yourself with people who can speak to you and have honest discussions with you. Um, you know, so I, I, that's that's it. That's all I have to say. There's more. And if you have more questions, certainly know how to get a hold of me. I'm here. <laughs> Thanks, Josh. Right. Yeah. Thank you, Harmon. Uh, okay. So uh, before I have everyone depart, uh, just a quick reminder that at the end, once we, we finish the webinar, you'll get a survey that's going to pop up. Uh, let us know what you think. You know, I hope you guys enjoyed the new format. We're trying to make it more conversational. We've been told that uh, that everyone enjoys that. Let us know what you thought of the different camera angles, right? We're trying to come at you with, you know, some some things to, to, to change it up, make it a little bit different, and hopefully keep you guys engaged. Uh, let us know, you know, topics that you want to hear. Again, uh, we'll have our next event coming up at the uh, at the end of next month, so last Wednesday of June. You guys will get an invite uh, for when that uh, when that is um, the registration is available to all of you. So, uh, once again, thank you all so much. We 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 love having you all as part of the Aprium family, and we look forward to seeing you guys next month.